Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word. There's a possibility we'll complete this book of Hosea, meaning salvation. As we, as we uh, completed the last lecture in chapter 12, uh, verse 10, remember what it said? God said, hey, I sent you types, that's to say similitudes, of exactly how it's going down. You know, and what has been is going to be again implied. So you need to keep your head out of the sand and watch what's going on. Because I warn you through the prophets and uh, you need to pay attention. And he, then he gives us quite a history lesson and he's still continuing that as we pick it up in chapter 12, verse 12, with that word of wisdom from our father and verse 12 reads, And Jacob fled into the country of Syria and Israel served uh, for a wife. There is changed name, he that pretended, he that contended with God, okay? And for a wife, he kept sheep. Um, and uh, God blessed um, uh, everything he did, actually. Everything Israel did, he blessed, okay? 13, and by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt. And by a prophet, was he preserved? In other words, he kept alive uh, by a prophet. Who was that prophet? Well, it was Moses. Okay. Moses, when he was 80 years old, uh, was sent to, back to Pharaoh to, to uh, release the children of God's children as they were in captivity. Okay. He, he kept his word. And um, Israel did listen until they got out in the desert. And then when Moses went up on, that, on the mountain for 40 days, they reverted all the way back to calf worship. It's kind of a shame. It doesn't speak well of the people uh, when they turn away from God. Verse 14, Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Ephraim is always that 10 tribes, okay, because he was the largest tribe. Therefore shall he leave his blood upon him, and his reproach shall his Lord return unto him. In other words, what you sow, you reap. You want to always remember that. What God has said in this chapter is, hey, I've sent you the word. I've sent you prophets. I've, I've given you types to go by as to what happens to a people if you do thus and if you do thus. You need to pay attention or you're going to pay the price, okay? And, and so it is even to this day. You sail your own sh Christian ship. If you put her on the rocks, hey, tough luck for you, friend. Don't try to blame it on God or anyone else. You were the captain. Make sure you keep it running as God would have you keep it. Chapter 13, let's continue. When Ephraim spake trembling, this, this is when, when Ephraim in the Hebrew spoke with authority, he exalted himself in Israel. But when he offended in Baal, he died. That, that is to say he was doomed okay, on that downward slope. You know, you, you've got God's word, stick with it. Don't listen to the traditions of men. Don't go by the way of men. Stick with God's Word. That's why He sent the Word, is whereby you could be pleasing to God and receive His blessings. Verse 2, And now they sin more and more, and have made the molded images of their silver, and idols according to their own understanding. And I want you to underline that. Not God's understanding, not someone else's understanding, their own understanding. This is where you get in trouble if you don't go with God's understanding, God's explanation, God's truth. You listen to man by his own little work, his own salvation out, he's headed down. Okay. You see, it always goes back to that first verse 
when Ephraim spoke with authority, what was he speaking? The Word of God, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Not traditions of men. That makes the difference. Their own understanding, all of it the work of the craftsmen. They say of them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. Well, I, I could add a little bit to that as an old Marine, but I won't. But this has plays back to, to um, uh, Samaria, where Joraboam, the old king at that time, made the two golden calves and said, you don't have to go down to Jerusalem to worship. You can worship the golden calves right here for the ten tribes. Okay. This is where they began to get in trouble. Okay. That's where they were doomed when they listened to man rather than Almighty God. Verse 3, Therefore they shall be as the morning cloud and as the early dew that passeth away, as the chaff that is driven with the whirlwind out of the floor and that is the smoke out of the chimney. Well, what happens to smoke out of the chimney? It goes into nothing. What happens to uh, a morning cloud? It never amounts to a hill of beans. As soon as the sun hits it, poof, it's gone. What happens to the morning dew? It's beautiful, uh, crystal clear, but it evaporates. It's gone. Does very little good. And so it is um, with man's religion. Doesn't amount to a hill of beans. It will lead you down Primrose Lane. Your own ideas, when, why would you listen to your own ideas or some other man's when you've got God's? And it brings blessings. Verse 4, Yet I am the Lord thy God from the land of Egypt, and thou shalt know no God but me. For there is no Savior beside me. You listen to that. And, and, and so it is. There is no other way. Man might work out, try to work out salvation by his own way. You're not going to get there because this whole book, Hosea, means salvation. And this is the way, the path, and the road to salvation. He is the Lord thy God. I am Yahweh Elohim. And there's no other. Verse 5, I did know thee in the wilderness, in the land of great drought, in other words, when, when you were wandering in that wilderness, I took care of you. I fed you. I coddled you. I, I, I gave you a cloud to keep that hot sun off of you in the daytime, and I gave you a fiery pillar at night to guide you. And they still, he says, what he's saying is, I took care of you. And do you know something? He'll take care of you today if you listen to him. But hey, if you want to listen to men, you go ahead. You know, men will tell you, you don't have to understand the book of Revelation. You're going to fly away like a big bird. That's not scriptural. That's man's tradition, not God's. God makes it very clear in Ezekiel 13, verse 20, that he's against those that teach you to fly to save your soul. It's Christ that saves the soul. And there is none other. And he can take care of you wherever you are. It doesn't matter how rough it gets in the rest of the world. As long as you obey him and follow him and use common sense, you're going to do just fine because God's going to bless you. Verse 6, according to their pasture, so were they filled. God was saying, I'm your shepherd, the only one, and I know how to tend that pasture. They were filled and their heart was exalted. Therefore, have they forgotten me. They, they got out there, and when the good times were rolling, and then boom, Moses goes up on that mountain, and next thing you know, they're having an orgy down at the bottom. Forty days. Verse 7, Therefore I will be unto them as a lion. Now understand what this is. God's saying when they're worthless, not when they obey Him, not when they are blessed, but when they go against God, he will be as a lion, as a leopard. By the way, will I observe them. Have you ever seen an old lion or a leopard as they observe a kill? Man, they do not take their eyes off of it. And what God is saying, when you go wrong, I don't take my eyes off you. 
Well, he, he's what he observes and what you do, he puts it in the book, the book of life. It's written right by your name. Verse 8, I will meet them as a bear that is bereaved of her whips. It doesn't get much worse than that, friend. Don't you mess with an old mama bear if something's happened to her cubs. And will ruin the call of their heart. And there will I devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. Have you ever seen a, a, a lion, you know, a canine, he's, he cuts off the vascular system and just holds and holds and holds. That's, that's, uh, that's the way a dog, wolf, or something of that nature takes a prey. But a lion doesn't. A lion rips and tears and shakes and shreds. And that's what God says he will do. This, this word call is, uh, is an interesting word. It's, it's the pericardium, okay? The pericardium is the, I'll call it the sac in which the heart rests. In other words, it's the outer lining of the heart, the pericardium is. It's just like the pleura that's around the lung, okay? You, you don't want to get that messed with. Right? It encases the heart. So what are you saying? I'm going to just rip your heart right out of you. And he, take this spiritual. You show me a person that God has had to punish them to the point that their heart is ripped out. I don't mean literally, I'm speaking spiritually here. They are so far down that they're hurting big time, but they bring it on themselves. And you know what they'll probably do? One that is ignorant of God's word would turn around and try to blame God for it, okay? where he's trying to get their attention to save them a trip to hell, the burning fire because he loves them. God chastises those he loves. That's a little severe when we get down to the call or the pericardium right to the center of the heart. That's life itself in the flesh. Nine, O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. Don't ever, ever, ever forget that. Okay, Israel, that Thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. To return, repent, come home, prodigal son, make your way back okay, to our Heavenly Father. He's a forgiving Father, and He's a Father that loves His children. Verse 10, I will be thy king. Not some man, not Saul. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities? There isn't. And thy judges, of whom thou saidest, give me a king and princes. God allowed it because God wanted to be the king. But oh no, they wanted somebody they could touch. 11. I gave thee a king in mine anger and took him away in my wrath. And uh, I mean, he, he was a madman. And poor little old David, I mean, he about slammed, pinned him to the wall with a javelin. 12. The iniquity of Ephraim, the sin of the ten tribes is bound up. His sin is hid. What is God saying here? He says, I've got it in a bag. What he means is it's written in the book. Got every line of it. It's, it's hidden from sight of most, but I've got it. I know. I'm observing. I'm watching. And beloved, he does watch you. He knows you. Verse 13, the sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stray long, stay long rather in the place of the breaking forth of children. In other words, this, this is kind of a play and it's said in a sense in irony, but it's saying we've got the birth of a new age and he doesn't want to break into it. Uh, if you stay in the, the birth past too long, you're dead. But uh, it shows the stubbornness of people that will re not recognize the times and the seasons that we're in. When God gives us these truths, whereby the similitudes, the types, the way, whereby you know what time it is. He said, he's one rascal. Uh, the rascal is my word. He's saying stubborn 
to the point that he would refuse even to be born. What does God say in 14? I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I'm going to redeem them. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. I'll do it. I will, I will not let this happen. God loves his children. Verse 15. Though he be fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come. This is not that old hot, dry wind. It's a soft, soothing wind. You want to pay attention to this. I said it's a soft, soothing wind. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, and his spring shall become dry, and his fountain shall be dried up. And then the whole subject changes, and I don't want you to miss it. The word he here is the Assyrian, which is the similitude or the type of Antichrist. It's talking about the Assyrian. He shall spoil the treasure of all pleasant vessels. Uh, he's going to come. And, and as God's elect, you don't even have to give it a thought because that's your purpose. That's your destiny is to follow God and to, and, and to know that God's on the throne and we have nothing to worry about. You know, uh, a coward dies a thousand deaths, but a brave man dies but once. And there's no death involved in this. But it means why be in fear and shake when God himself has promised. Uh, this, this, word, this word redeem is, is a real wonderful word. Gael in the Hebrew. It means to, a kinsman redeemer. What God is saying, I'm your kinsman. Meaning I'm your father. And I'm going to redeem you. Verse 16, Samaria. This is the ten tribes as they were there with the golden calves. Shall become desolate, for she, shall, she hath rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword. Their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with child shall be ripped up. That, that means through deception. When that Assyrian, the Antichrist, comes, they're going to flood to him. And this is why you must stay with your father and stand against that because the whole world is going to go whoring after. And this is why that God would tell in chapter 1, Hosea, go marry a harlot okay, to show us the way. Let's, let's go right into chapter 14. Let's complete this book. O Israel, return unto the Lord thy God, for thou hast fallen by thine iniquity. Your faults are taking you down. And this is speaking of the whole nation here, not on an individual basis. We have many of God's elect that are, are, are shining knights and champions of the people within that flow of the Christian nations of today. To take with you words. Which words? God's word. You got it? Don't ever forget that. Take with you words and turn to the Lord. You return. Say unto him, this is what you say to God, take away all iniquity and receive us graciously. So will he render the calves of our lips uh, with thanksgiving and repentance. He loves us. Now, I want you to not overlook the word graciously and um, as it is there, because that's a play on the names of the children, which I'll, uh, let's read one more verse. Asher, Asher has no article here. It's the Assyrian, okay, which is the type of Antichrist, shall not save us. There's no way the Antichrist is going to save you. He has, he, he has not the ability because he's going to the pit himself. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands, Ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. That word mercy is love. It's ruama. Okay. And, and I want you to, what are the fatherless? The orphans. Okay. 
those that are orphaned, that have no idea who they are, those 10 nations of Ephraim that went north over the Caucasus Mountains, that settled Europe, later coming to Canada and the United States of America, the superpower of superpowers, no accident, God's plan. And God chooses those whom he will. Now, I, I, with the names of mercy, that's love, we have and can understand the whole book of Hosea. And I'm going to sum it up in this way. He told Hosea to go marry Gomer, which was a harlot. And Gomer means uh, uh, totally full of sin. I mean, there's no room for any more. And he said, you go, go marry her, and when your son is born, you name him Jezreel. And Jezreel, that's the point of salvation, beloved. Listen to me. That first boy was named Jezreel, which has two meanings in the Hebrew tongue. To scatter, which he scattered those ten tribes all over the world, the Christian nations of today. And it also means to sow. So everywhere those seed hit, the truth was sown. And in these end times, that true word of God springs forth to the point that people are warned whereby they know how to sail and stay out of sin and know that God is our Father. And then he said, you're going to have, um, you're, you're going to have a, a, a daughter and you're going to call her Lo Ruhama, which means not loved, okay. not pitied, some would translate. And then you're going to have a, a, another son. You're going to call him lo Ami. Lo in the Hebrew means not. Okay. Not my people. Ami is people. God denied them. But then as way back in chapter 2 as it closed out and as these two verses signify, he changed lo Ruoma to Ruoma means I have mercy on her. I love her. And Ami means you are my people, and I love you. So you have salvation of glory within verses three, uh, 2 and 3 there in, in this beautiful, beautiful, the orphans come home and find out they weren't orphaned, orphaned at all. They had a father all the time, our Heavenly Father. He's watching, and He loves you. Verse 4 to continue, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for mine anger is turned away from him. When they get their act together. Verse 5, I will be as the dew upon Israel. He shall grow as the lily and cast forth his roots as Lebanon. That old cedar of Lebanon, those huge roots that are so stationary and the fragrance so wonderful. And do you know something? In the spiritual sense, there's a lot more to it because the cedar, especially the cedar of Lebanon, no moth, no insect is going to bother it. This is why you build chests of cedar if you want to put wool in them so that moths don't destroy the property. Verse 6, his branches, that's his children, shall spread, and his beauty shall be as the olive tree, the tree of our people, the oil for healing and the oil for prayer, and his smell as Lebanon, the freshness of that cedar, okay, the, the olive oil, el -Yah. God's names, El is, and Yah, which is Yahweh, that, that's, that's, that is when I, what am I, well, what are you saying, El uh, Yah? It's olive. Okay. The olive, when you anoint someone with it, it does not heal. But it is your obedience to God to use that oil. And then God does the healing. And many, many, you know, I'm disappointed in people when they say, well, I didn't know Christians were supposed to do that. And they show their ignorance even to know what the name of Christ means because Christ is the anointed one and the very etymology of his name comes from rubbing as anointing with oil 
and they think Christians don't anoint when we serve a Savior that is the anointed one? Verse 7, they that dwell under his shadow shall return. I, I don't know where do you dwell. Does that rope of his love that we read of a lecture or so back where he says, I'm going to pull them right out of there with a rope of love. Are you entangled within the love of Almighty God that he draws you? Are you under his shadow? They shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. The scent thereof shall be as the wine of Lebanon. Again, that beautiful, beautiful fragrance. Snow Mountain is what Lebanon is, okay? Verse 8, Ephraim shall say, this is the ten tribes, the Christian nations, shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? Question. Well, I would hope finally waking up and knowing that anything you place before between you and God can become an idol. You can worship it. It may be your business where you give it all your attention instead of bringing God into the equation whereby your business is blessed and you prosper. I have heard him and observed him. Now listen carefully. This is your father speaking. I am like a green fir tree. From me is thy fruit found. Now, do you understand what that means? And it's important that you do. Why did God say, I am a green fir tree? Because it's an evergreen. It is symbolic spiritually of eternal life. You know, let's take an oak tree. What happens to it? Frost comes, bam. I mean, it just stripped bare. It just stands there naked as a jaybird. Okay, nothing on it. But that evergreen is always green. Therefore, spiritually speaking, it signifies eternal life. A lot of people, you know, they, people let the heathen rob from us. A lot, of, a lot of Christians will say, it's heathenistic to put up a Christmas fir tree. What are you talking about? What do you mean it's evil to put up a green fir tree to symbolize the conception of Jesus Christ? You, are you going to let Babylon rob you of everything, every truth, without understanding God's Word? I think not. God saying, I am like a green fir tree, because it symbolizes, it is the similitude, it is the type that is symbolic of eternal life. You don't worship it, but you worship God and you listen to Him, and you follow Him. It is no different than we use the oil. We don't worship it, but we use it in obeyance. Verse 9, who is wise? Well, that's a good question. And he shall understand these things. Well, why, how would a wise one understand these? Because he listens to the Word. He picks the subject and the object and he sticks with it. Why? Because it is God that declares the subject. It is God that declares the article. It is God that declares the, the object. Therefore, you have clear understanding. If you get some one verse revolving rev that just picks a little verse here and a little verse there, you have no idea what the subject or the object was that it was taken from. But don't worry, he'll, he'll put a bunch on it. He'll lay it out for you, but it may be foreign to what God said. That's why it's so important to be wise and listen to God. He said, I was their shepherd when they were in the wilderness. Is he your shepherd today? Is that rope of love cast out there to lasso you into his service, his kingdom, eternal life? And he, that fir tree that that, that, that is symbolic of eternal life. Never, never uh, dying, always green. Who is wise and he shall understand these things? Th that's a statement. 
not maybe, not perhaps, a wise person will understand these things, prudent, and he shall know them. In other words, um, our Heavenly Father will always share. This means gifted even, if you would. God gives this gift of knowledge and understanding to those that uh, will uh, partake of the gifts that God gives us. The truth, the Word of God. For the ways of the Lord are right, not left, not somewhere in between. God's ways are always right. You can count on it. And the just shall walk in them. The just are the upright. They, they are God's elect. You're going to walk in the paths that God sets forth because you wouldn't want to be caught somewhere else because you love Him. The just shall walk in them, but the transgressors shall fall therein. There's, there's, you know, when God makes it so clear and someone still goes the other way, there's not much you can do about it. The millennium, hopefully and prayerfully, will make a difference to some that did not have an opportunity to know the truth because they weren't wise. But wisdom is a precious commodity. Wisdom is understanding the common sense and the simplicity in which God brings forth His Word, His Word that consummates the end of this age, His Word that gives you eternal life. You hear what he said? Grave, where's your victory? I'm defeating you. Death, where's your victory? I'm going to do you in. Because he is that evergreen, eternal life. And he's got it there for you. There is no other salvation other than in him. What a book, the book of Hosea, meaning salvation. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed bringing it to you. God bless you. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. Hey, that number is good from Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular denomination or, or reverend. Let's don't judge people. I know sometimes it may sound like the word is being judgmental, and it is, but it's our Father. Our Father is the only judge we need, and you need to know of a certainty that He is that judge. He doesn't need us uh, trying to do His work for Him, that is to say, as far as judgment is concerned. You are to discern, but not judge. There's a big difference. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Now. Got a prayer request? We can do away with the number and the address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. Just as sure as the pericardium encases the heart, your true mind here, the heart's only a pump. But He knows your mind. That, that beautiful um, organism that can retain more than a computer, if you'll exercise it, if you'll use it, our Father gives that to you. That's what causes you to be able to understand and gives you wisdom. 
Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and questions. We've got Mildred from Illinois. I listened to your program and I've learned a lot of the words. I did not know what they meant. I have a niece who lives in Wisconsin, not far from Milwaukee. If you are on a station out there, what one would it be and what time do you be on? She would like to hear you. I will write it down if you puts it, put it out on your program. Well, I'm, I'm going to give it to you. First of all, we are on both the direct and dish networks for satellite receiving. And we're on 24 hours a day on the C format satellite, our own transponder. But the stations in, in Milwaukee are WCGV uh, 24, and we're there um, uh, Tuesday through Saturday from 3 to 6 a.m. We're there three hours a day. And the, another station there that we're on is WVTV 18, uh, Monday through Friday at, from 5 to 6 a.m. Okay, a nice time. I hope she enjoys it. Uh, Tom from Pennsylvania. Uh, in Paul's teaching, he says, I'll tell you all a mystery. There will be some who shall not sleep or die. Am I to assume then that when Jesus Christ returns and sets up his government, that all mortal bodies, blood, will put on heavenly bodies and, and not taste death? Will the new earth age have life in the blood of, or, or it's, it's spiritual, okay? Now, first of all, we have the millennium coming before that. You're, you're quoting from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, okay? And Paul is saying it's going to happen in the twinkle of an eye, just bang, that at the Greek is real specific here. You know, the last trump, in the Greek, it's the farthest trump out. That's the seventh, okay? At the seventh trump, all, I mean, sinners, saints, everybody have a move into spiritual bodies. Why? Because that puts you in the same dimension as our Father, okay? And, um, uh, and brings us into that millennium age. Uh, and the people that live in the generation of the fig tree, many of them probably will have that instant change. Bovell from North Carolina. No one remembers the world before this generation. That age was blotted out. For this reason, man cannot conceive an age before this. When the son of perdition and all evil are blotted out, don't you think this age will also be blotted out? No, I, I don't think so. It isn't necessary. The evil, um, all, uh, and, and I'm going to give you a documentation, okay? In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, uh, it makes it very clear that, the, that this earth age that we're in now, that it will be destroyed with a terrible heat. But it says, doesn't say world. It says, it says that the elements will be destroyed. This word elements is rudiments. The Greek word is stanchion. What it's saying is all the bad will be burned up, not the good. Okay. This is why the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace, seven times hotter than necessary. And Nebuchadnezzar looks and he says, well, I see, how many did we put in there? I see four. One is the Son of God. And they weren't even singed. You see, God knows how to take care of his own. And that's why that incident transpired, is so that we would know that only the bad burn, we don't. Okay? The bad elements, the rudiments, the stanchion. Okay? Uh, your documentation again, in case you didn't catch it, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. Uh, Eddie from Texas, thank you for teaching the Word of God. You are welcome. I have learned a lot. I have a question. How and why does an evil spirit get into your body? Please pray for me, me and my family. We can do that, Eddie. An evil spirit cannot enter your body unless you allow it. 
as it is written in that God gives us power over all of our enemies. In His name, of course. He gives us power over the serpents, the scorpions. He gives us power over all evil spirits. They are subject to us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we use authority. And they run from us. They're afraid of us because it means death to them when we order them back where they came from. So they want nothing to do with the man of God. So you don't have to worry about evil spirits. They, they enter because people allow it. Many times you can you take, um, a lot of people don't know it. Do you know why that the old bottle is called a bottle of spirits? But if, if you don't know what you're doing and, and you're, um, you have that old disease called uh, alcoholism, there's all kinds of spirits in that bottle. And they will take you under. Okay? They will weaken you to the point that you'll invite him in. And many times you can have a good old buddy that can, I mean, he's loaded up with a whole six pack of demons. And you say, come on in, good buddy. You invite him into your home. Uh, you see, you need to anoint your home and declare nothing evil, cross that threshold, that doorpost with the blood of the lamb on that door. Okay. And um, you need to take authority. They have, to, they have to obey you. Frank from California. Did Jesus Christ go down to hell and preach when he went to get the keys of hell during the three days he was uh, considered dead? And did any of the souls in hell listen to his preaching? And were they saved and let out of hell? And if so, what scripture can I find these? Well, it's real easy. Uh, First Peter, we were in Second Peter a while ago. First Peter, chapter three, verse eighteen, that Christ went back to the beginning, all the way to the beginning to Noah, to to those souls that were in prison. They, they passed on, and he preached to them. And in chapter 4, to answer the second part to your question, many prisoners were let go. They, they overcame. You, you have to understand, our Father loves all of His children, and God is always right. We read that today. Let me, let me tell you a, a point of wisdom. When God is always right, would it have been right had He, everyone that died, or that lived after Christ paid the price, had uh, were were uh, salvation was available to him, but everybody that died before that it wasn't. That wouldn't be right. That wouldn't be fair. So naturally, God had to send Emmanuel, God with us, back to them, which they were already in paradise. Some on the wrong side of the Gulf, as as Luke chapter 16 declares. But many of them believed him, and were saved at that time, you bet. Okay, um, got Judy from Virginia. Is being stubborn a sin? Well, there is, there is the spirit of stubbornness. You, you, you can recognize it. There are some people that have a spirit, it doesn't matter what you say, they're gonna come out with an argument against it just for the sake of arguing. Just, just so, just because they can, okay. They feel it's their duty. They were born to, um, to be, um, to, to, to be the opposition. That, that's a bad spirit. It truly is, and it's very difficult to. Uh, and the second part: What is the difference in righteous indignation and anger? I end up feeling so angry and bent out of joint at people who are so stupid that they don't even realize when they are aiding and abetting in the destruction of our great U.S. of A. Well, you know, righteous indignation, you can do that. You know, if they come against God, they try to remove God's name. We can be very indignant about that. That righteous indignation is called for, okay? And, and Christians are not second-class citizens. We don't let somebody push us around, okay? And, and um, God tells us, well, always turn the other cheek. Uh, 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 let's do it right. You only turn the other cheek if you were talking 
salvation to someone, this is what God was prepared, Christ was preparing them for, and you overload his donkey with real truth, and so usually, let, let's just use a little um, analogy here. Let's say that you went up to some preacher and said, you're, you're lying when you teach your people that the rapture is going to happen because it's a lie. And he reaches out and taps you on the face, then you turn the other cheek because you overloaded his donkey. Okay. You shouldn't have done it just in that way. Okay. You, you, you sugar will catch a whole lot more flies and bad preachers than just <laughs> whatever. Okay. Now, so uh, that's when you turn the other cheek. But if somebody, if that same preacher comes up to you on the street and for no reason pops you one, you deck him. Okay. I mean, you, you knock him down and educate him. He needs an attitude adjustment. Okay. So you give him one. And, and then pray for him, of course, all right, as a good Christian would. And uh, you know what will happen next time before he walks up and tries to pop somebody? He's going to say, whoa, uh, that doesn't pay dividends. All right. God, you got to do what's right. Karen. And Karen is from, I'm not sure where Karen's from. It doesn't say. Okay, let's see what. I am a 60-year-old grandmother. Your site on the computer with the books of the Bible is just such a blessing. You see, my grandson will do studies with me in the evening. My health just won't let me get up always. Please let it on the air well, it, we're, we're going to leave it there, dear. It's going to stay. You see, my grandson was stuck on drugs so terrible. Now he says, come on, Mima. I, I need a Bible study with Pastor Murray. God bless you and your sons well, and staff. Well, thank you, dear. You, don't you worry. We're going to, as long as God allows, we're going to have that. We're going to have the programs on the computer as well as on television, as well as on satellite. God sure blesses us. We, we, we thank our Father for it. Uh, Rodney from Michigan. Where in Scripture can I find the passage that says the unpardonable sin is not allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through us? Luke chapter 12, verse 10. It says when, when you can say just about whatever you want to uh, about the Son of Man as He walked the earth. But when he comes as the Holy Spirit and you're delivered up before the synagogue and it means the synagogue of Satan and you disallow the Spirit, that's unpardonable. I cannot imagine that happening though. I know God's election pretty well and I know they all know and have been taught that it is the Holy Spirit that will speak through them. And I know them well enough to know some of them are going to have a hard time keeping their mouth shut to keep from telling him what they think of him, okay? So um, that, that'd be, they'd be more likely to bend the other way, but I don't believe that one of God's elect will commit the unpardonable sin. They're too ready for action. They, they, they want to get it on. And uh, if Antichrist wants to try it, hey, go for it. Um, Nyla from Nebraska. I, st I studied with you since 88. Hey, this is my 20th year with you guys. Well, God bless you. I still can't understand why Jesus prayed for the cup of wrath to be taken away from him. I understand it this way. Jesus was God in flesh, was all-knowing, people's minds, God's plan, had no temptation since he knew the whole story. Was this so we could see God's compassion for us and his wish that he wouldn't have, have had to do it. I've studied and prayed on this so often all this time, it's time to ask. Well, I, I'm glad you did. Uh, you, do you remember in Mark 13 where Christ said, no one, meaning himself, knew when the instant that the end would happen would come only our Father in heaven? So you see, even though Emmanuel was God with us and the flesh became, the word became flesh and walked among us, there was still a division there, okay? And, and naturally, Christ being the loving Savior that he was, was hoping 
that that prophecy in Jeremiah and Isaiah concerning the cup of wrath, that there would be an easier way we could convert the people without uh, destroying the rudiments and many of them along with it in flesh bodies to get them to wake up spiritually. Okay. And our Father, He loves them enough, He's going to correct them. That chastisement will no doubt save many lives. And that's why it must come to pass as it is written. And uh, Jesus was honest, straightforward, and humble in asking, uh, not my will, but yours, okay? Because uh, that, um, call it an office if you like. He applied to the higher office and, and God would not approve it, okay? The cup of wrath is going to be poured out but those that love God do not have to worry one iota about it. It will not touch you, even if you're right in the middle of all of it, okay? I hope that helps. Brian from Wisconsin. I really enjoy your body study, Bible study because I get around so good. I don't get, I can't get around so good to go to church and I, I have multiple sclerosis. Well, God bless you. <clears throat> Where in the Bible does it talk about the three earth ages? Before Noah's flood, one, and the present age, two, where's the third one? Where does the dinosaur fit into this? I've read about it in Job. It was in the first earth age, okay? The dinosaur was in the first earth age, the behemoth, as Job mentioned. I never was taught that in the 50 years about the three earth ages. Well, I'm sorry you weren't, but to not know about the three earth ages is like having a set of blinders like on an old horse where you can't see what's happening out on beside him. Um, you can read of the three earth ages. Uh, we've already talked about it once today. Second Peter chapter 3 speaks of all three of them. Same earth, but different ages. Same heaven, but different ages. The word is eons in, in the Greek, not world. Okay. And um, it speaks of those three earth ages. If you want to know what happened to the first, you can read of it in Jeremiah chapter 4, beginning with verse 18, where God says, My people are just a little bit sottish, which means my, my poor children are just a little bit stupid. All right? And there's nothing wrong with that word. It simply means they don't know. And just like you say, in 50 years of church going, you hadn't been taught the three earth ages. And that's really sad. It really is sad because that's the beginning of seeing our Father's overall plan of salvation. And um, our Father certainly loves us. I hope that helps you. Uh, incidentally, if you have a companion Bible, Appendix 146 goes into details on the Kathabo, which is to say the overthrow of Satan and speaks of the floods of the earth age. Alan from Virginia. Thank you for your special insight into God's Word. Well, you're welcome. My question concerns the kings and queens of the ethnos. Could those living now be direct descendants but not necessarily royalty themselves? Anyone that loves our Father and is of the ethnos, the kings and queens, they're children of God. That uh, makes them God's elect. And, and the royalty of God's house are servants to all. In other words, when, when God elevates one, you become a servant to all. That means you're going to teach, lead, guide, direct, and allow the Father to use you to help the very least, we'll say, on that totem pole. So really, the kings and queens is only a term that means they are the leaders in the third earth age, as it is written in Revelation chapter uh, 21, verses 20 through 24, okay? In other words, they have their own kingdoms aside from the kingdom of God, but they come to God to worship. Barbara from North Carolina, let, let, me, let me say something. The word nations, because that's what you're going to read when you go there, the word nations in the Greek is ethnos, and ethnos is where we get our word ethnic, the ethnic peoples, meaning the Gentile uh, peoples. Barbara from North Carolina. Where in the Bible does it say not to worry about people who get ill-gotten gains? God will take care of them in heaven 
in the uh, judgment. Um, it's an acrostic. That makes it a little tough for one that doesn't have a companion Bible or the Hebrew manuscripts, okay? But I, I can, I'll just tell you, if you have a companion Bible, you go to the 37th Psalm and it'll give it to you. But <clears throat> an acrostic means that God has hidden by, say, making, giving everything in the song four lines, but then all of a sudden here's one with three in three different places. And you will find it in the seventh verse, the 20th verse, and the 34th verse. And what those three verses say as it teaches the lesson is don't think that the wicked get ahead always. Because in that 20th verse, then it says, because as a lamb is cooking on a spit over the fire, as the fat drops into the fire and the smoke of sin, so are they. And the 34th verse in that uh, acrostic says, and you're going to be there to see it. Okay. So the wicked never get ahead. They only think they do. That's a beautiful acrostic, meaning a hidden truth that God has placed in, in his word. And it's, uh, if, with the companion Bible, it's laid out for you, the acrostic. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But most of all, God loves you for it. You know something? It makes His day. And when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. Okay? You bless God, He will always bless you. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, Again, blessing God, He will always bless you. But what's most important, it's this, that you, in your life, you stay in His Word. Set aside a little bit of time each day. Stay in His Word every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.